Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I don't have any announcements, so we'll go straight to questions. Jim. Thank you, Jay. Um, as the President prepares for this uh, speech on the Middle East this week, uh, the, the region's in upheaval. Uh, they have stalled Israeli-Palestinian talks. Uh, bin Laden is dead. Uh, how, does, how does the President link all those things together, and what is he attempting to accomplish uh, <coughs> with, this, with this speech and with all the activity that's taking place this, this week? On the Jim, you make a great point that, that we have seen just a remarkable amount of activity of change in these six months. We have, uh, or five months, uh, more in, in five months than we've seen in 50 years in many ways in the region, in, middle, in the Middle East and North Africa. And the President looks forward to giving this speech as, and sees it as an opportunity to sort of step back and, and assess uh, what we've all witnessed, the historic change we've seen, uh, and, and to talk about how he views it, uh, the change we've seen, as a moment of opportunity and uh, a, an opportunity for us to explain to the world what our values are and the values and the principles that we bring to uh, the region uh, as we decide what uh, policies this administration, this country should pursue uh, to support that change, to support the uh, democratic aspirations of the people in the region. Uh, and he'll, stop, he'll talk specifically about uh, ways that we can best support that positive change. Uh, and, and while focusing on our core principles, nonviolence, support for human rights, and support for political and economic reform. Does, he, um, does the President agree with King Abdullah, who was quoted saying yesterday uh, that injustice, uh, the stalemate in the Middle East process, and loss of hope are major factors behind continued tensions and violence in the region? Particularly that issue is the uh, unsettled uh, peace talks. Are those an element? The pre well, he will certainly, the President will certainly discuss uh, the Middle East peace process in the speech. It is an element, obviously, of uh, uh, the speech as well as the, you know, the discussions about what's happening in the region. I think that uh, the fact that there needs to be progress in those peace talks is, is something the President very much agrees with. I think that, as we've said uh, uh, most recently, I said yesterday in, in responding to a question about activities by the Syrian government, that conflict is often used by other regimes in the region, by other governments in the region to distract from the problems in their own countries. And uh, we also uh, uh, think that there's a history of that and, and that what we have been seeing in many cases in uh, these past five months is uh, demonstrations by people of these countries protests uh, against their governments in, in, in demands for more political participation, for greater uh, individual freedoms, greater economic prosperity, uh, that is really um, the source of future instability in the region. And while we obviously believe that there needs to be progress in the Middle East peace process, uh, there are many other important problems to address in the region uh, to, uh, for the governments in the region to, to answer the legitimate grievances of the people. Uh, uh, that they represent. If, if I could ask on, on another point, the, the President today once again uh, didn't take questions from the White House press corps uh, when he met King Abdullah. If we haven't had an opportunity to ask the President anything since I believe the near government shut down. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering why is that? Why he's in the middle of he's taking up a lot of issues from immigration sure. to debt relief to uh, the Middle <clears throat> East. Why, why well, I'm not? sure Jim, you'll have opportunities for those of you who are traveling. He will be uh, taking questions on our uh, upcoming foreign trip. And as you know, he has given uh, some interviews in that time to journalists who have asked him questions about all uh, of the pressing issues of the day. Uh, and he'll continue to do that. Uh, uh, you know, I think his track record of taking questions and giving interviews is, uh, is, is very strong and will continue to be strong uh, going forward. Yes. Uh, Jay, uh, a couple of things. Can I start with the IMF? Um, is the administration concerned that the ongoing uncertainty about the, the, the future of Dominic Strauss-Kahn damaging the IMF in any way or its ability to function? No. We, we retain uh, full confidence in uh, the IMF and its uh, continued capacity to fulfill its obligations, uh, to fill its role, uh, rather fulfill its role in the global uh, economy during this difficult period. Um, and uh, as I said yesterday, that, that remains our position today. Okay. Uh, notwithstanding that, at some point the, um, the job of managing director of the IMF will be open at some point in the future. Now, the President in the past has said that he'd like to see 
an enhanced role for emerging economies in the International Monetary Fund. Would he support the long-standing tradition of the IMF managing creditors <coughs> position being held by European changing and going for the next turn to someone from the emerging world? I'm not going to talk about the process for uh, selecting potentially a future head of the IMF from here. I don't really have any comment on it. I, I think the important point is that we uh, believe that the IMF uh, can and will continue to function and, and fulfill its, uh, its role in the global economy. Changing track um, to the debt and uh, budget discussions, uh, Newt Gingrich over the weekend called uh, Representative Ryan's Medicare plan radical. Um, does the administration think that popular um, opinion about the Medicare plan from the Republicans strengthens the position of Democrats in the uh, debt and budget discussions? Well, that's a complicated question that involves a lot of moving pieces. I, I would note that uh, without uh, wading into a dispute between Republicans, I would note that the former Speaker of the House once said that he hoped to see Medicare wither on the vine, and yet his position now is seen as uh, too far to the left by some people in his party. I think uh, what we believe is that, as the President has stated very clearly, is that Medicare uh, needs to be there for seniors. Uh, the commitment to guarantee that it provides uh, uh, needs to be retained and that our approach is to find the savings that we can within the program as we have demonstrated in the past and going forward as we deal with long-term deficits and debt reduction while uh, maintaining that guarantee. And we, we obviously disagree with some with the approach that House Republicans ha have taken in their uh, proposal which would essentially eliminate Medicare as we know it, and turn it into a semi-privatized voucher system, which we uh, we do not support. Yes, Jake. Uh, Jay, on the Middle East peace process, how can Israel be expected to make peace <coughs> with the Palestinians given the reconciliation between Fatah and Hamas, and Hamas in its charter has called for the destruction of Israel? How can how can there be any way forward there? What what is the president suggesting to King Abdullah? What will he suggest to Bibi uh, on Friday? Well, Jake, as we've said, we're watching developments uh, in the Palestinians' territories, and we're watching them very closely, and we've made it clear that Hamas uh, must stop its outrageous use of terrorism and recognize Israel's right to exist. Uh, that remains our position. It has not changed. And obviously, any participation in a Palestinian government uh, would require that uh, it abides by those uh, standards, in our view. and. Uh, that's why we're continuing to monitor the developments and, 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 and reports about the reconciliation and, and, and where it's headed. Is there anything possible? We're talking, the President said that um, now more than ever it's vital to have the parties return to the table. Is anything even possible given this reconciliation with Hamas? Well, again, we, we're sort of looking into the future in terms of what uh, the Palestinian government might look like in terms of the reconciliation, we've made it clear that our principles have not changed, that uh, Hamas must stop its use of terrorism and must uh, recognize Israel's right to exist. And those are core principles that, that, w that we stand by. Um, uh, sw switching to a domestic issue, the White House and the Department of Health and Human, Service, Human Services has granted um, more than 1,300 waivers <coughs> uh, for businesses, unions, corporations uh, for the health care law. Can you explain uh, why so many waivers have been granted? Uh, well, first of all, that's not that many if you consider the number of businesses that we're talking about here. The, 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 the waiver is not a waiver of the law. It is a provision of the law. And it is specifically designed to ensure that those uh, individuals in some uh, uh, places of employment who have mini-med mini -med plans, these, these very limited coverage plans, uh, retain the coverage that they have uh, while the transition, the implementation of the health care law takes place. By 2014, beginning in 2014, when annual limits are completely banned, uh, all Americans will have affordable coverage options and these waivers will uh, no longer be necessary and will no longer exist. It's basically a bridging mechanism to get, to ensure that those folks who have these mini-med plans, who have this minimal level leverage of coverage, are able to retain it during this period of transition. And how, are the, how is the decision made? Has anybody been denied 
Uh, one there of have been uh, 1,372 waivers granted, and uh, fewer than 100 waiver applications have been denied. And why were they denied? You'd have to ask uh, HHS. Yes, Dan. Um, when, when can we expect the administration to announce <coughs> new sanctions on Syria, and will those sanctions be focused directly at President Assad? I believe you, you probably heard the Secretary of State mention that uh, we are looking at additional measures uh, that we might take, uh, and that is obviously the case. And um, I don't have timing for you, but we are continuing. <laughs> Uh, I don't want to get ahead of uh, myself here, but we are looking at ways to continue to put pressure on the Syrian government, the Syrian regime, uh, to uh, uh, pressure it so that it ceases the violence uh, against its own people and that it uh, engages its people in uh, peaceful dialogue uh, and begins to uh, respond to the legitimate grievances that the Syrian people have. Uh, we will be looking at taking additional measures to do that. In the peace process, you said how the President sees this as a moment of opportunity. How big is this window of opportunity, and in light of, of uh, what we've seen spread across the region, is this now or never? I, it depends on what you're referring to. I mean, I, I, my answer is no, it's not now or never, but we are in a historic moment uh, with regards to what's been referred to as the Arab Spring. I don't think anybody in this room has seen anything like it in their adult lifetimes. And uh, it presents a unique opportunity for the United States uh, and our allies to embrace and support the kind of change that will uh, improve the lives of the people of that region and improve uh, the security of the United States of America. Uh, that is an opportunity not to be missed in the President's view. And while change can be unsettling, uh, it can even be scary because we don't always know where it's headed. Uh, it is something in this case to be embraced because the opportunity is there uh, to help shape a better future uh, for the region and for the world. In terms of, in terms of the opportunity to jumpstart the peace process which is installed, um, is, is how, how big is that window? <laughs> <laughs> If you're asking specifically about the peace process, I, you know, I, I think that I'll let the President address that in his speech in terms of specifics and how he wants to uh, discuss that. Uh, I think the President has been very clear, uh, as has the Secretary of State and as have others, that we need to uh, move forward with that process, that uh, the circumstances uh, are difficult and they uh, are not likely to magically resolve themselves. So the parties need to sit down and negotiate and move forward on a peace process that, that reaches a resolution, a two-state solution that we obviously support strongly. Yes? Jay, I just want to be clear, but in the speech on Thursday, will the President be essentially setting forth a new policy on the Middle East peace process? Again, I think there's a focus on the Middle East peace process here that I want to uh, clarify, which is the speech is not about the Middle East peace process. Uh, it will include uh, a discussion of uh, the conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians and the peace process, but it is uh, a much broader speech than that that looks at developments in the entire region, the historic developments that we've seen in these past uh, five months since, or six months since uh, uh, that street vendor in Tunisia uh, took that dramatic action that he took. So uh, again, I want to make it clear that he's using this opportunity to step back and talk about what we've seen, what's transpired, the approach that he's taken in, in applying the core principles that he holds uh, to the whole region and to the unrest that we've seen in the whole region, but then obviously looking at U.S. policy and applying those principles uh, in a country on a country by country basis because, as we've said, obviously each country is different. Policy or will there be elements of a new policy? In, in, with regards to peace process. The, again, I don't want to get into specifics about, yeah, because I, the, the President will be, will have some specific ideas about how the United States can support the positive change in the Middle East and North Africa, the broader region, on the specific Israeli-Palestinian conflict. He will address this. I don't want to raise the curtain 
beyond that on the specifics of uh, that element of the speech. On the, on the broader, the kind of thing Dan was talking about, sanctions, things of that nature, will the president make news? Will there be? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the not on that specific, <laughs> on any issue. Will he be I can say news? safely the president will make news on Thursday when he gives this, gives this speech. And I mean that in, in, the, in the language that we understand, that yes, he will have some specific new ideas about uh, U.S. policy towards the region. One other issue is that uh, in his speech, in one of his uh, fundraiser speeches last night, he said, we're just a quarter of the way through. And uh, Hillary Clinton today is quoted as saying that, uh, quoting a discussion she had with the president recently in which they were talking about leaders around the world who were in power for 10 or 20 years and how terrible that would be. Uh, and she quoted the president as saying, I'm going to get reelected and that's it. Sounds like he's taking reelection for granted. Oh, I uh, can assure you uh, he is not. Uh, at all, and he's focused very much on uh, the job he has to do as president, uh, the uh, enormous array of challenges that this country faces uh, right now uh, occupy uh, almost all of his time. And uh, But when it comes to the uh, coming election, uh, he's taking absolutely nothing for granted, and he, uh, he understands very well that we live in a very competitive political environment. And uh, which is why he will, when the time comes, you know, make a case for, for re-election. Yes. Uh, Jay, you've spoken out several times about Syria. We've heard the Secretary of State speak <coughs> out about Syria this morning. Uh, should we expect a message from the President in a speech directly to Assad or Syria? I don't want to get any more specific than I have about the elements of the speech. Uh, I, I want to make sure you tune in or show up. and. Uh, cover and, and write, it, uh, write about the speech, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave that uh, alone except to say that, to echo what the Secretary of State said, which, which we are looking at taking additional measures uh, uh, to add to the pressure we're trying to put on the Syrian government to cease the violence against its own people. One quick one on a domestic issue. Uh, Ed Lazier from the previous administration wrote an opinion piece in the Wall Street Journal uh, talking about the jobs market and said uh, the reason why it doesn't feel so good right now is because we're not necessarily adding more jobs, we're just not having as many layoffs. Uh, do you guys agree with that assessment? Well, I'll say two things about this. Uh, since Mr. Lazier was in the White House, obviously, uh, uh, well, two things. One, when we came into power, there were, when, when the President took office, there was already lost four million jobs. Uh, and within uh, a number of months after that, another four million had been lost in the recession. That's quite a big hole to dig uh, the country out of. Uh, we measure the job situation based on the data that everyone sees and receives, which has shown us that we've had uh, now 14 months of uh, uh, net job creation, private sector job creation, and three straight months of rather strong uh, net private sector job creation, three quarters of a million jobs in three months. Uh, I think that's very solid news. Would we argue that? We're there, that there isn't more to be done? Absolutely not. We, we strong, that's why the President wakes up every mo morning thinking about what ways, what can we do to further our economic growth, to continue the positive growth that we've had, to continue the job creation that we've been experiencing, especially the strong job creation lately. Uh, but we, you know, we're, we're still, we still have a ways to go. There's no question. And there are people uh, who wake up every morning and worry about their job security and worry about whether or not they're going to be able to find a job. And we understand that, and that's uh, the focus of uh, all of the President's economic policies. Yes? Um, back to the Palestinian-Israeli issue. And, um, <coughs> you said that the United States has core values when it comes to looking at this situation, human rights, nonviolence, uh, support for economic and political reforms. Um, on the issue of nonviolence, how does the, the President view the nonviolent protest that the Palestinians staged over the weekend? I, I know you've singled out the, the situation of Syria, uh, where there was clearly some incitement to do this by the Syrian government. Um, but there's now talk of more protests, nonviolent protests, as a, perhaps a, a next way of trying to exert pressure on the Israelis. What, what is the President's view of that tactic, nonviolent protest on the Palestinians? Well, I, I, a couple of points I would make. One is that I think I made uh, this uh, point yesterday, is that obviously Israel has the right to protect its own borders. Uh, and, uh, and that's an important point. The other, other point, obviously, is that we would urge, uh, obviously, restraint on all sides. And uh, we want uh, progress in peaceful 
negotiations uh, uh, is obviously the goal that we seek. So, um, but I think it's important to note that uh, you know that Israel, like all countries, uh, has has the right to, to uh, protect its borders. It's been asked other ways, but I, I guess I'm not clear on how the president now plans to move things forward in a way that's different than things have been in the past. Given the, the new reality, mm -hmm. what seems to be a new reality of this unity government that the Palestinians have formed, um, given that reality, what, what do you do? How do you, how do you um, besides demanding that uh, the Hamas wing of this renounce, uh, accept the state of Israel and renounce violence, can you deal with any aspect of that government? Well, we, we obviously deal with the existing government, the prime minister and the president, and we, uh, we encourage both sides to move forward in the peace process. And, and, and as we make clear our position on the things Hamas needs to do, uh, in our view. The broader, stepping back, there is, this is a moment of opportunity, and, it, and, and not just for other countries in the region, but uh, for, for Israel and the Palestinians as well. There is historic change taking place in the region, and, and uh, uh, proof that there are universal aspirations, a desire for greater freedom, greater political and eco freedom and economic prosperity that, that crosses borders, uh, crosses ethnicities, crosses nationalities. And uh, it's incumbent upon the political leaders of uh, the whole region to, uh, to try to take steps that, that encourage that positive change uh, and, and to do it because that is, that is really the future for their countries and for their peoples. And, and as we've said about other countries, the uh, efforts to uh, use, uh, to resist the positive change will not lead to greater stability. Uh, and uh, so we think it's very important that Everybody in the region look at this moment as a, as an opportunity for for to to move forward uh, on behalf of the of the region, on behalf of the peoples of the region, on behalf of uh, of the world. Uh, in Pakistan, there was the arrest of an Al Qaeda uh, operative, a guy named Muhammad Ali Qasam. Um, the Pakistanis described him as a major figure. Um, some in the U.S. are not describing him in that way. Um, what is your sense of how significant this is? And um, is it something that has happened as a result of the Bin Laden episode or you know, pressure on the Pakistani government to cooperate and be more aggressive? Or how should we see this? Yeah. I, you know, I have to confess, I don't have anything for you uh, on that except to say that, I, as we've uh, been saying for the uh, uh, last couple weeks, that the relationship that the United States has with Pakistan is very important. It's complex and it's uh, sometimes complicated. Uh, but it is vital to our national security interests, and maintaining that cooperative relationship uh, is uh, a high priority, precisely because it is in the interest of the United States of America and the American people that we do maintain that relationship. And it has led to some very uh, important achievements in the war against Al Qaeda and the war against terrorism in general. Uh, and we look forward to continuing that cooperation with the Pakistani people and Pakistani government. Just one last one on, on Syria. Uh, there are now reports of mass graves near the town of Dara and, uh, and other places in the, in the country. Um, the death toll is approaching 1,000, depending upon, um, well, some human rights groups are saying that. Uh, as, the, as the president looks at this situation and, and compared to Libya and other situations, what is the, how much longer can this go in that direction before there is a need for some um, more aggressive response, not necessarily militarily, but some yeah. some kind of response. I, I know there's no tripwire, no line in the sand to use, no to use cliche, but, but uh, how do you, how does the administration see these recent developments which seem to be going in the, in the wrong direction? Well, we strongly condemn the unacceptable behavior, uh, and we've made it clear that the recent events in Syria, uh, we believe, uh, prove that the country cannot go back to the status quo ante, that uh, Syria's future will only be secured by a government that reflects the popular will of its people. 
The window is narrowing for the Syrian government to shift focus away from repressing its people and towards meeting the legitimate aspirations of its people. And as I said, we are looking at additional measures that we can take, uh, and we continue to enforce the measures already taken, the, the longstanding sanctions against uh, Syria and the specific targeted sanctions that we announced recently. Uh, but we, we remain very concerned about this and, and could not uh, uh, be less clear, I mean, could not be more clear, rather, about uh, our insistence that the Syrian government needs to cease the violence because uh, the window is narrowing for its opportunity to embrace the demands of its people and work with uh, the Syrian people in peaceful dialogue uh, to respond to their aspirations. Yes, Laura. Um, two questions. First, you spoke a moment ago about the moment of opportunity in the Arab world, the historic change taking place across the region. Does that sense of a moment of opportunity also apply to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Or did you mean that to encompass that, that they also have a moment of opportunity? Well, I would just say that, that broadly speaking, the changes in the region present an opportunity for positive progress. And uh, I will leave the specifics about uh, that conflict uh, to the President's speech, but uh, except to say that, yes, broadly speaking, there, well, I don't want to draw it in too firmly because obviously each, just as each country in the region is different. Uh, you know, this conflict is distinct, uh, but it is an opportunity. There's something special about what's happening now that does present a I think opportunity. You're talking about developments in a region uh, that are unprecedented in a half century, and, and that has, uh, I think, repercussions and hopefully positive repercussions throughout the region. The, um, separately, European leaders are calling on Strasskon to <coughs> resign for the good of the institution. Does the U.S. feel the same way? Should he resign from the IMF? I don't have anything more on the IMF than what I've said. There's no, no position on whether he should keep his keep his. He should stay in that position right now. Uh, again, I'm, I, first of all, it's, uh, there's that. This is, involves a legal issue uh, taking place in the United States, and I. But uh, beyond the IMF, I don't have any more comment. In terms of not so much whether he should be forced to resign, but whether it would be wise for him to resign. Yeah, no more. Uh, I don't have anything else on that. Yes, sir. Uh, today, Queen Elizabeth is making an historic visit to Ireland as a symbolic gesture, putting old grievances aside between the Republic of Ireland and Great Britain. Since the President seems to be focusing on a similar dramatic cha cha changes in the Middle East this week, does the Queen's visit give him much hope that, uh, that those uh, resolutions may exist in, in those regions? Does he take much hope from that? And will the President be asking Her Majesty for some advice? Uh, it's entirely possible. Uh, I, I, I have not uh, uh, had that discussion with the President about what conversations he may uh, anticipate having with the Queen. He's very much looking forward to the visit. He uh, also is visiting Ireland, very excited about that, in addition to the United Kingdom. And, uh, and the, the, the progress made in that conflict uh, uh, is uh, an important uh, precedent for the capacity for uh, parties that have been in conflict for a long time to reach a peaceful reconciliation. And, and uh, uh, so in that sense, uh, I think the answer is yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on the Middle East, is the September deadline still possible? I mean, is it a realistic deadline now? Yeah, I don't want to get into any more specifics about it, because the President's going to give a big speech about the Middle East region. So, and, and on the on the peace process itself, I'll, I'll leave it to him. What would need to happen for the talks to be revived, though? I mean, what would be? the way forward, like economy. Yeah, there are obviously a number of people uh, involved directly in the negotiations who could answer that question uh, more concretely, but obviously uh, a certain amount of will and a desire to sit down and, and uh, move forward with the peace processes. I mean, that's the, the basic requirement. And on the budget talks, when is uh, the Vice President's next budget meeting? Has a date been picked for that yet? I don't believe we have a date, but we expect uh, after uh, both houses of Congress are back in town. Well, what kind of talks are going on now? Who is the Vice President talking to as the House? Is there are staff level conversations continuing uh, on a regular basis. We uh, remain uh, 
optimistic about the progress that those uh, talks uh, have made so far, and we look forward to greater progress being made uh, when they resume. But staff level conversations are taking place this week while the House is in recess. So the Vice President is I, 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 I mean, I know he is deeply engaged in this process. I just haven't checked in with him or his office to see if he's had any specific conversations in the last 48 hours, but it's entirely possible. Yeah. Jay, could you talk a little bit, not about the content of the speech, but sort of the process over the last few months as, as events have unfolded, how the staff decided that a, a bigger narrative was, was needed here? Well, I, I think there have been discussions uh, for, for a number of months now about uh, finding the right opportunity and the right time for the president to, to step back and, and give a speech about uh, that takes into account these sweeping changes, these historic changes in the region. Uh, and uh, from there, it's just been a matter of uh, you know, finding the venue and the, and the date and, and the appropriate moment uh, to do it, and, and we settled on, on this Thursday. In Laden's death plan. As I think, uh, unfortunately, has been reported for quite a long time, the uh, uh, discussions about having a, a speech like this, have the president, having the president give a speech like this, uh, well predate the death of uh, Osama bin Laden. Following up, why the State Department as, a, as opposed to here or somewhere else? Is you know, I think obviously when uh, we, I think we, we, the decision that we would do it in Washington, and, and I think the State Department is an excellent venue because uh, it speaks to uh, where our efforts in the region uh, will emanate principally, which is uh, that they will be diplomatic efforts. They will be, uh, you know, even as we maintain uh, our fierce fight against Al Qaeda and uh, terrorism in general, uh, and even as we continue to uh, work in Afghanistan to uh, make progress there uh, and break the momentum of the Taliban and uh, make the kind of progress that will allow us to achieve that transition to an Afghan lead, uh, and those are principally military efforts, the uh, military and intelligence efforts. The, the, you know, the, the longer future in the Middle East, we believe, you know, will have a huge diplomatic component to it, and uh, the State Department is an appropriate place to give a speech like this because of the role uh, that agency will play in, in achieving the kind of goals the President will, uh, will talk about on Thursday. Yeah. Um, Jay, last December when Secretary of Clinton uh, laid out the, the way the U.S. was going to move forward with the Middle East uh, in the wake of the direct negotiations uh, between Abbas and Netanyahu falling through. She said the U.S. would revert to proximity talks, to indirect negotiations. Um, yet, between last December and now, um, there didn't seem to be any high-level U.S. engagement in trying to make that happen. Uh, Senator Mitchell made no trips to the region at all during this intervening period. So my, my question is, why wasn't there high-level envoys, Senator Mitchell or others, that were trying to make these indirect talks uh, actually you know, begin to unfold? I mean, was there a judgment made that because there was so much going on elsewhere in the region that it didn't make sense, or maybe some other reason that explains it? Well, I, the specifics I'll leave to others to discuss, and perhaps uh, in reference to the State Department's uh, prominent role in these kinds of things, uh, you might uh, get more specifics from the State Department. I would simply say that whatever the means by which you pursue this effort, uh, the pursuit has been consistent and intense. And it is very, uh, it is very much uh, uh, a priority of the President to continue to push for progress in the Middle East peace process. And I think you'll hear that again from him on Thursday. Yes, Chris. Jay, can you speak to this report that the president, there's a draft of a speech floating around that says the president will urge Israel to withdraw to the pre 1967 borders? Yes, again, that report is completely false. We have not uh, uh, shared a draft uh, of the speech with uh, anyone outside of the administration. Will he talk about, for example, the 1967 borders? I don't want to get into the specifics of uh, his discussion at all. Uh, but I can tell you that the, uh, no one outside of this administration has uh, uh, been shown a draft of the so speech. The report is, is inaccurate in that it says that there's a draft copy of the speech. Well, a report that says that it has specifics about a speech based on a draft that, that, that doesn't exist, I, I don't have any comment on the content of a draft that doesn't exist because uh, no draft has been shared with anyone outside of the administration. But there are drafts, correct? 
we are still working on. How He's not going to wing it. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, no, but seriously, there there are drafts when the pres a speech is never done until completed until the president delivers it. But in the meantime, there are drafts, correct? Sure. Okay. Yeah, there's a process by which the speech is written. The president reviews it, makes edits. The speech is rewritten, adjusted according to uh, what he wants, and and that's the, that normal process is being uh, followed. But it, this is a, a, a fairly tightly. Uh, held process in a relatively small circle. Yeah? Can we make any commitments to visit Israel? I don't want to, uh, again, get into any specifics uh, about the President's speech beyond what I've said. And can you just describe any of the talks he's had with Middle East leaders uh, about the, ahead, of the, ahead of the speech? Uh, any consultations with the leaders? Well, as you know, King Abdullah was uh, here, and, and he has had consultations and conversations with a number of leaders of the, in the region in general over these past five months because of the remarkable events there and, and recently uh, in anticipa anticipation of giving this speech but also uh, uh, because of the uh, uh, successful mission against Osama bin Laden. Uh, so th th those conversations have contained uh, uh, discussions about uh, his views of the historic change in the region and, and his vision for how the United States can best support positive change in the region, uh, uh, both uh, uh, with leaders from the region and with leaders from elsewhere uh, among uh, uh, the nations of the world. Yeah. Um, Jay, going back to the speech, is the President going to announce anything new on Thursday night when it comes to Osama bin Laden? Information? That I don't anticipate that. I mean, I, I think the speech is much more uh, forward-looking about, about the change in the region and how to Take actions that support positive change in the region. Okay. Well, since he's not, since you just said he won't, you don't expect that. You, you tricked me into giving a specific. <laughs> not, but yeah. I didn't trick you. I just asked the question. You chose to answer the way you did it. So anyway, um, well. <laughs> so anyway, um, going back to Bin Laden, since the raid and, and death of Bin Laden, you in that raid, uh, information was obtained and. Intelligence officials are going through that information. What new can you give us an update on some of that information? Also, you know, early on um, after 9 11, there was talk about him and his health issues. What do you know specifically that's um, pinpoint on about his health issues? Because we were told that he had mm -hmm. um, kidney dialysis issues, or kidney issues, he was on dialysis. And other people were saying that they didn't find those kinds of machines or anything mm -hmm. of that nature in the raid. Could you talk to us about what? Is spot on now from that information that you get. April, that's a, actually a very interesting question. I don't have uh, any more detailed information for you on that. I, uh, the our personnel are obviously redu reviewing the uh, considerable amount of information that was gathered, uh, and uh, initially for uh, any evidence of imminent threats, which is why uh, in the immediate aftermath of the raid there was the. Uh, alert about uh, the consideration that had taken place uh, of it uh, going after American Railway System. It was an old consideration, but it felt it was important to get that out. Uh, and then obviously for, you know, there's just a variety of information that would be reviewed uh, that would uh, help in our, in our fight against uh, Al-Qaeda and, and, and terrorist networks. So uh, beyond that, I don't have any details. Did you have any reaction to Trump's announcement yesterday that he's not running? <laughs> oh, go for it. Uh, <laughs> and he's not tricking you. <laughs> no, I'm trying to uh, remember from yesterday. And, you know, not, nothing uh, su surprisingly uh, uh, subdued reaction, Just I would say. Proving that he is. <laughs> Going for it. It's a good one. I wish I had thought of that. But, but no, I, he did not have a particularly notable reaction. This pounds around the White House. I'm not even going to go there. Stephen. Yeah. <laughs> on this issue of there being a moment of opportunity, don't the events Trump? so far of the Arab Spring mm -hmm. suggest the opposite, that it would be even more difficult to forge peace, given the fact that the new Egyptian government facilitated a tie-up between Hamas and Fatah? and that the Israelis being more concerned about their borders and their security seem even less inclined to make compromises than they would have before. 
I, I think it's important to note that, again, the moment, uh, there's a lot of focus here on the Middle East peace process, which is an element, obviously, of the region and an element of the speech the President will give on Thursday. Uh, and that, obviously, has always been a complicated, difficult issue, uh, resolution of which has eluded a number of leaders in the region and, and a number of uh, administrations. Uh, we continue to pursue that aggressively. The, uh, the fact that the change that we've seen in the region is, um, has uh, created some uh, unpredictability is without question. And uh, it has certainly been said by uh, students of the region that uh, one of the prices of the search for the demand for stability has been the kind of uh, repression that we've seen. And obviously that the unrest that we've seen in the region uh, has uh, created a, a certain amount of tumult and we have to assess uh, the developments as they come. Overall, the President believes very strongly that this is positive, that the opportunity for positive change here is substantial. And uh, again, reminding you of the core principles that he holds when he looks at the developments in the region, uh, he thinks that the uh, possibility for democratic reform, for governments that uh, are representative of their people, that answer the legitimate grievances of the people, that provide them greater economic opportunity and political participation, uh, that, that opportunity is real and the potential for positive change is great. Positive not just for the peoples of the region, but for the United States and its allies. So, that being said, will he stick to his position that it's also important for the United States not to be seen as an actor in any of these uprisings? The President has made clear, and, and others, including myself, have made clear that we cannot dictate outcomes, uh, and nor should we, in the case, in case, if we could, nor should we, because one of the reasons uh, for example, if you look at the developments in Egypt, uh, it, it, it's very important to deprive those who would repress their populations of the straw man accusation that the expression, the legitimate expression of, uh, of a desire for change by people in these regions is somehow uh, being in, uh, forced upon or inspired by the United States because uh, these are legitimate demonstrations of uh, popular will and uh, it's important that that's made clear. Yes? Trey, I don't know if you've seen uh, President Abbas op-ed piece today in the New York Times, but he was explaining why the Palestinians has to go to the UN to get recognition. What do you honestly hope that will happen between now and September to avert this decision? Can I have another question? Well, again, we, we believe very strongly that progress towards a two-state solution needs to come in a negotiating process and not through symbolic acts. Uh, and we, we encourage the sides to move forward with the peace process and the negotiations. What's your follow-up? Yes, yeah. um, there's criticism in the region that this administration is big on speeches and very short on following up, especially when it comes to the peace process. Is this a fair criticism? Uh, I don't think so. I think that the, uh, this administration has been assiduous in its pursuit of uh, peace in the region and trying to uh, help move the process forward and, and continues to do that. And, and in terms of the broader region, again, I think uh, the suggestion that uh, we have not taken significant actions um, that have been uh, helpful towards a process of positive change in the region, I think, would be mistaken. Um, yes? Thank you, Jake. Um, how does his speech compare to the Cairo speech, and what did the President, uh, what has he learned uh, during this period since the Cairo speech, uh, besides what happened in the, street, the Arab streets? Well, that's a big exception that you've uh, carved out there. I think that one of the things that's, uh, I think, important to remember and remarkable to me when I look back at the Cairo speech is how, in many ways, it ends. You know, not that anybody could have predicted or certainly uh, the President has suggested that he predicted uh, the, the timing of this development, but it, it recognized the importance, the President understood the importance of uh, the changes that were beginning to uh, show themselves in the region. And when you have such a, a young population and a population that's uh, in, all the, in so many countries that's uh, 
uh, frustrated by a lack of economic opportunity, frustrated by a lack of uh, an ability to uh, participate politically, uh, that, that there was a, uh, a coming um, uh, movement for change, and that that had to be recognized and engaged by the governments in the region uh, or else in the sense that if, you, if, you, if you're looking for the future stability of your country, you need to um, engage your people, you need to harness that change, you need to uh, do it in a peaceful manner and, and move forward in a positive direction. Uh, because as, we, as I was just saying about Syria, there is no going back. You can't put the genie back in the bottle. Uh, and, and I think that's, uh, there are echoes of that in the President's speech in Cairo, and I think uh, he'll discuss that on Thursday. Thanks, Jay. Explain, uh, keeping some lines, like we have received three leaders that would belong, a lot of people in the region would call them uh, part of that trade off between stability <coughs> and reform and democracy. Mm -hmm. How does he explain what coming those leaders here at the White House at the same time when there is a fluid situation in the Middle East? Well, I think we, the principles that he has stated uh, apply in the way we look at every country. We've called on and, and, and uh, complimented those. those uh, leaders who have engaged in political dialogue, who have moved towards political reform, because we think that is uh, the way to go in response to the legitimate aspirations of the people uh, in their specific countries and in the region. Let me take one more. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I want to follow up on the Ireland question and the possible lessons. Um, here, everybody is focusing what the U.S. can do. Mm -hmm. Will the President also talk about the limitations as long as the leaders of the conflict parties are not willing to move in their positions, then even a mighty mediator like the U.S. can't achieve very much? Well, I don't know that he'll speak to that specifically, but it, but it, is, it is a truth that, that uh, in all conflicts like this, the, 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 it, is up to, it is incumbent upon the leaders of uh, the, the conflicting parties, the, you know, the parties in conflict, the, leadings, the leaders of the nations to desire progress and desire uh, peace, and, and, and that is a, a baseline starting point. There's no question. Uh, what the United States can do is help facilitate that, uh, as it has tried to do in the Middle East peace process uh, through a number of administra administrations, and, uh, and also make decisions, as it has in some of the cases with uh, unrest in the region, to uh, either quietly advise and assist or uh, make clear that we're uh, not inserting ourselves into a process because it is a uh, a process that's unfolding uh, uh, organically from the street, if you will. Uh, so there are things we can do uh, either uh, actively or uh, passively that can help encourage the process forward. Thank you all very much. Thank you.